But boy, is the game afoot. Uh, ahead of an election in October, but we seem to have an administration, a government, maybe in its death throes, that is, boy, trying to progress some of the least sensible and most controversial and damaging of its agenda. Um, and I'm talking in particular about issues around freedom of speech and hate speech and control. Because if anything, if anything has typified this administration, this government, whether it be under Jacinda Ardern or Chris Hipkins, it has been the desire to control its citizenry. The expectation that it has a level of control over you and your motions and even your thoughts, certainly your utterances. And there is a philosophical belief in the current government that they know what is right, that they are the single source of truth and that we must create a system where only that truth can be tolerated. Uh, if you were listening yesterday, you know we broke the story on the Department of Internal Affairs discussion document. <laughs> if you believe that, you're naive. Discussion document on a new regulator essentially for online activities. And I watched the coverage yesterday, and look, look, this is such a bad idea, such a bad idea, even, even the, um, the mainstream media, the legacy media like stuff say it might not be a good idea. Television New Zealand say it might not be a good idea. There's something called the Media Safety or something Council, which is a bunch of the old legacy media dressed as up as something important. Even they think it's a bad idea. And it is such an importantly and stunningly bad idea and it will have such an impact, I believe, on you. And certainly, and I'm not going to dress this up, might have a massive impact on the platform and our freedom of speech and our ability to do what we do. Um, that we, of course, are going to make it a major story. That's why we made it our lead story yesterday and it's our lead story today. And as I said, underlying it is the idea of control and of regulation by the government, uh, not only of your utter utterance, but in, in effect, uh, the natural conclusion is of your thoughts and your actions. Uh, amongst the many people, the many people who are concerned about this Department of Internal Affairs, well, discussion, document, plan, is the leader of uh, the ACT Party, David Seymour. He joins us by video link now. David, good morning to you. Good morning, Sean. Look, on the face of it, this is dressed up quite nicely. Uh, we've got to stop stuff online that makes girls anorexic or means that people say really nasty or harmful things about other people. Um, and that's the way this is being sold to the public. Um, and also because technology has adma advanced so much, we just need to do this. Do you buy any of the rationale behind the proposals from DIA? No, I don't. And let's go back to first principles. Why do we stand for free speech? Uh, why did ACT oppose and ultimately, I believe, defeat the government's hate speech laws? Uh, well, basically because the censor, the regulator, the witch finder general, call it what you will, uh, ends up being a person with more power to do more harm than any speech could ever do in the first place. And the reason that they have the power to do harm is that they are not subject to the rule of law. Uh, they don't have to set out clearly uh, what it is that you would say or not say that would make you innocent or guilty. And as Paul Moon, the AUT uh, history professor put it, uh, hate speech laws are laws where you don't know uh, if you are guilty uh, right up to the point uh, where you're convicted because there's no way you could tell. It's entirely someone else's opinion whether you just have a, a vigorously held view uh, or if you have somehow crossed uh, a line that no one really knows where it is. Mm. Uh, that's why we oppose hate speech laws. And this proposal uh, is worse in the sense that while it might be something to have, uh, you know, a, a, a guideline that's forced by the courts according to the law, 
Uh, this is something that is going to be put together outside the democratic process by we don't know who, uh, but somewhere someone is going to decide what are the naughty things. And if you're someone doing business on the internet, if you have a mailing list like ACT does, like I suspect the platform does, uh, if you have a website, if you have a following, then all of a sudden uh, you are answerable to this group somewhere uh, that you have no influence over. So this is an enormously chilling uh, idea. Uh, it is, again, uh, this government that seems to believe that they know what's best for our own good and they're prepared to take away our freedom to express our own ideas and all protect us. It's just astonishing. We already had, have laws, of course, no matter what technology exists, to stop people doing bad things. To stop people charging, uh, you know, dealing in child pornography, um, inciting violence against others. We have a raft of laws existing, don't we, that cover the bad stuff that can happen in our society. Well, that's right. And, you know, again, when we have the debate about free speech, it's important to be clear that nobody I know is an absolutist. Um, you know, everyone I know is opposed to child pornography. Everyone I know is opposed to inciting violence. Everyone I know is opposed to threatening violence. Most people I know would say if the courts suppress something, then you should respect the court's jurisdiction and not be in contempt of court. There are lots of restrictions around what people can say, uh, but those restrictions are consistent with the law. You know where the line is, that uh, the law is made openly and democratically, and if you're accused of breaching it, then you can call on the law in your defence uh, and say, Your Honour, or to the jury, I have not broken this rule, here it is in black and white. Uh, the problem with what's being proposed here is that we don't even know who the lawmakers are and whether or not you've broken one. Uh, entirely uh, subjective, decided in some star chamber kangaroo court, and the net effect of that is people who will feel that it's harder to express themselves, that there's more chance of pylons and cancel culture, uh, will see the state in some form, who knows what, uh, coming along and saying, actually, you can't say this. Mm. Uh, but, you, but you didn't know at the time you said it. Yeah. The regulator would also, of course, be a government body and therefore, as a part of the Crown, it would have to... Um, it would, of course, have to um, pay suitable homage and lip service... Well, not lip service, real service, to the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. And I note that uh, even DIA say, oh, yes, we'd be looking out for anything that was uh, against the principles of the treaty and we'd be implying our code on that. Well, again, this is why it's inconsistent with a free and democratic society. One of the things that needs to be debated, and ACT would say needs to be debated a lot more publicly and vigorously, is what the treaty means. Uh, is it some sort of compact between two races, as Jacinda Ardern likes to say, where you have to look at your family tree to find out what your rights are? Um, or does it guarantee, as I like to say, na tikanga katoa rite tahi, the same rights and duties? That's what the treaty says. Uh, now, am I going to face uh, some regulator where if ACT puts out an email uh, saying, well, we actually think the treaty is a liberal democratic document, and they say, oh, no, 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 that's not our principles. And this is the problem that, that I began with, is that the censor, the regulator, uh, they, of course, themselves are politicised. They inevitably are because they're just people at the end of the day, but they're people that have the power to suppress your expression, uh, and that leads to unfair debate. So that's why... Number one, you know, this initiative needs to go. So if you were, you know, thinking you didn't have enough reasons to change the government yet, if you didn't have enough free thought act, here's another one. Uh, we will stop this. Uh, but second of all, um, we need to actually have a proper debate about what our treaty means because I don't think anything in the treaty uh, tells us that we should be divided into two types of people. There was never any consent for this. No one ever asked, would it be better if we divided into two races? No one ever said, yes, that's a great idea, and that's why it needs to stop. Mm. David, bottom line, that this legislation, this well, this proposal is sunk if you are going to give anyone the ability or, or join a government that governs New Zealand? Is this bottom line? 
Well, as you as you know, I I don't like the yeah. But I, I, I I'm asking you the question, and I ask you in complete self interest because to me this is an issue I would vote on. Yeah, well, you know, you know, you know my thoughts on that term, but I think you can be pretty safe uh, to think that uh, you know, in a government that acts and isn't going to tolerate this kind of thing, we have fought for freedom of speech. Uh, as long as we've been in Parliament, it's the foundation of a free society and you won't see us advancing this in government, that's for sure. All right. David, for those outside the Beltway who might not understand always how the Byzantine world of you know, government departments and politics works, my other simple question is, I would presume the people who work for the Department of Internal Affairs are just bureaucrats, right? It's actually their job to enforce the laws that are passed by Parliament and the policies set by the government where did this raft of nutty ideas come from and, and what gives the, these bureaucrats and all these unelected people who are pontificating about it, what, where do they get their mandate to even come up with this idea? Well, they will have been asked to do this by a minister. We have a convention in New Zealand called No Surprises, uh, so it's impossible to think that the Minister of Internal Affairs, and I actually forget, I, I thought it was Jan Tanetti, but she may have moved from that. She started getting into tr trouble in education instead. But whoever is the Minister of Internal Affairs will have known. Uh, they've got a responsibility to tell their colleagues. So the idea that this kind of thing can happen without ministers knowing uh, is a nonsense. Uh, in fact, you know, this is an initiative uh, that government that fits uh, like a glove on a hand when it comes to uh, Labour's they through speech. They lost that debate in the Democratic Forum. Uh, now it's being advanced by the bureaucracy in another way. But I would say that the way that the bureaucracy has grown, you know, it's up uh, by nearly a third, whereas the number of people in Parliament hasn't grown, the number of ministers in Cabinet hasn't grown, one of the difficulties that New Zealand has and that the next government will have down is we've got a self-perpetuating, self-generating bureaucracy that keeps on growing, keeps on coming up with these ideas, and they actually cost us in two ways. The first is we've got to pay tax to pay them, and they, they earn a lot. Uh, the second is the things they actually do are damaging to our ability to earn more money to pay more tax. So, uh, you know, the, the, the main thing that, that you need to do is take government and ask for everything government does. Imagine they didn't do it. Now, if through this thing, including this Department of Internal Affairs, uh, you know, we just come up with this idea, if they didn't do it, could we come up with a justification to start this activity tomorrow? And I can guarantee you, if we started governing from that point of view, instead of just carrying on with everything that did they did last year, plus some, uh, we would end up with a much smaller government, a lot less tax, a lot less debt and inflation, but also critic far fewer of these bureaucrats dreaming up crazy ideas uh, that ministers give them a free pass on that interfere in our lives. Mm. Because it seems to me in order to stop girls getting anorexic, you've decided to regulate new media. Um, I've also been slightly bemused, to be honest, David, suddenly um, mainstream or legacy media, oh, this is terrible. And they're the very people who have been perpetuating or promoting call-out culture, cancel culture, political correctness and, and wokeness. And suddenly they're going, whoa, they're going to come for us next. Uh, it's been quite remarkable <laughs> the last 24 hours. Yeah, well, you never know. Maybe Sinead Boucher will ring up and ask if it's a bottom line as well. Um, but I just think this is a very powerful uh, motivator. Um, and I heard a, a phrase once, I can't remember where it was, um, that, uh, you, you know, if you um, ha have their balls, then their heart and their mind will follow. Uh, and uh, it seems that uh, suddenly um, the government has got some of these legacy media by the balls and in 24 mm. hours uh, their hearts and their minds are followed. Mm. Uh, David, uh, and once again this is a question uh, perhaps loaded with self-interest but I'm happy to admit that. And this has, for I think spurious reasons, been connected together and the stories are unrelated. Uh, the platform is having some difficulty um, maintaining, or in fact I have had my accreditation to the Parliamentary Press Gallery removed on the grounds that I'm not a member of the self-regulatory body, the Media Council, and um, the Press Gallery Chair has wrongfully 
suggested that I might be able to be a member of the Broadcasting Standards Authority. Well, I can't. I was actually, uh, but I resigned. Um, but I'm not subject to the BSA because uh, I'm not a, a traditional broadcaster. Do you think, and they've changed their rules so that excludes the platform, do you think that is fair? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I think that obviously Parliament makes its own rules, I would assume, and I'm No, not the press gallery makes its government. rules, uh, not Parliament. But surely this, well, 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 Parliament makes its own rules and surely the Speaker controls access to Parliament. Yeah. Uh, so I would have thought that at, at, at least... Um, the Speaker has the opportunity to make this decision and, um, you know, just thinking about it now, having not thought about it before, uh, if the Speaker is supporting that kind of discrimination, um, then perhaps some of us in Parliament should take that up uh, with them because it seems uh, wrong that someone who's asked, you know, perhaps uh, one of the highest rated questions of a Prime Minister in recent time, uh, that went global, as I understand it, where the Prime Minister couldn't uh, define a woman, um, has uh, actually, you know, added some value. And it seems wrong that um, the rest of the press gallery is excluding you for that. Maybe it's professional jealousy. Yeah, thank you for that, David. I thank you for support, and I need all the help I can get at the moment as well. Look, I also want to look at this, just quickly look at, at this issue of the Department of Internal Affairs report in a wider context, because it struck me there is a pattern emerging here. And I look at a report out last week from um, a subcommittee of the uh, New Zealand Law Society. And that proposal is, David, that the Law Society give away its right to regulate, be the regulatory body for lawyers, and vest it in a new yet to be formulated government regulator. And that the government regulator should, according to this committee, should also be subject to applying the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi to the regulation of lawyers. And it seems to me that this government or administration has a penchant for taking regulatory control, government regulatory control, of all sorts of industries and areas. They've also done it with real estate agents, which is why they're doing compulsory Maori training or they lose their licences. This seems to be a pattern. Well, I mean, first of all, what, what the real estate agents have been asked to do is really just outrageous. It has no connection to their job. Um, much like the road signs, we're seeing every day practical activities being hijacked to socially engineer New Zealand. Uh, and that's not going to make us wealthier. It's not going to make us more cohesive. Uh, it's going to make us poorer and more divided. And this is why you hear people saying it's becoming a third world country. When it comes to the lawyers, uh, I think this is actually more critical than other areas. If you look at the frustrations that some people had with doctors, and we discussed this last week, uh, not being able to give exemptions to people who really didn't want to have a vaccine. Well, you can trace that back to the idea that the medical is to some extent uh, directed by the government. Uh, you do the same thing with lawyers and you've got a real problem because if you're accused of a crime by the state, one of the, th one of the defences you have, uh, one of the tactics you have is that you can retain a lawyer who is your advocate and loyal to you and obliged to give you the best defence that they are capable of giving. If you then say, well, that is partly loyal to you, but partly loyal uh, to this government regulator and its philosophical uh, objectives, then you end up in a situation where you don't actually have a critical part uh, of your armoury of defence uh, when accused of a crime by the state. Uh, so this goes to some really fundamental uh, constitutional... Well, David, uh, so if you get the legal profession, you take them out, then you take out the media, you take out the fourth estate, right, because you regulate them, as the Department of Internal Affairs is suggesting, and you've already got the doctors, right? It's game over, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. Well, what ACT stands for is a pluralistic society where power is not centralised but held in a wide range of institutions so that nobody can have a monopoly on power, nobody can damage your freedoms. But you're right in what you said a moment ago that this government is basically a group of student politicians. They believe in the essence of state action. 
and the world would be a better place if only they had more power. You look how it worked out with Kiwi Build, you look at Te Pukenga, you look at what they're doing to early childhood education now. Uh, they are highly destructive. They're like a kid with a big back um, in a glassware store. I don't think they even realise how much damage is occurring behind them most of the time, uh, but damage is occurring. And that's why it's so critical that not only do we get this government out, but we acknowledge that many of these built up over decades. And that's why it won't be enough to, to change the government. The change must be real. Uh, that's why I'm in the ACT Party. David, I thank you, as always, for your time uh, this morning. And you may not have made getting rid of this silly proposal a bottom line, but I get the feeling uh, you would die in a ditch to stop it happening, uh, which is in some ways comforting. Right. I thank you for your time. That is David Seymour, leader thank of you. the uh, ACT Party.